about 6,000 years since cities start popping up all over the world and they pop up not just in one place and spread out, so not just in the Fertile Crescent are going on, but the more we research, the more we see that cities are popping up all over. And it's something to do with the current warm spell, the Holocene, and it's something to do with bigger brains, and it's something to do with what's been happening to human evolution all that time. So somehow we got to a sweet spot where big brain humans who are used to using tools, who are already interacting with their environment, producing lots and lots of, res of new resources, you know, domestication of animals, domestication of plants. And then every so often around the world, they come together into little clusters. And once they are in clusters, once they're forced together, they need to organize themselves a bit. And then somehow the same answers crop up all over the place. So it's something which our species has done probably dozens of times separately, but all more or less the same moment. Most ancient cities were really small by modern standards. Um, the ones in the ancient Mediterranean particularly small, maybe three, four, five thousand people in each one. So we would barely count them in villages in most of the developed world. Uh, but every so often the, a few enormous ones appeared. And as far as we can tell, they're all created by imperial powers. So the only way to sustain a really big city is to draw in what you need from a huge geographical area. What you need is, is food, it's people, so manpower, which in the ancient world often means slavery. It's wood to burn, it's timber to build with, it's stone to build with, it's clay to make bricks. All of these things have to be concentrated. And as far as we can tell, the only way for you could do this concentration was by physical force or the threat of it. So some of today's great cities occur because of industry, because they're at key points for global market change. They don't need to have political muscle. They can be enormous cities without that. But in the ancient world, as far as we can see, what makes a small city a big one is almost always a king. I think it's often easy to see why some cities work, um, that they find themselves at good points in communication routes. So like the city of Corinth, which sits on this tiny narrow isthmus that connects northern Greece to the, to the, the big mouth of the, of the, of the Malia which is dangerous to sail around, and so people would sail into one of Corinth's ports and they would literally drag their vessels across a ramp down into the sea on the other side to avoid having to go on a long detour around the coast. So you can see why some cities have got something very special about their location. Others, it's often a bit of chance. And Milan, I think, is probably always quite an important city, but becomes really important because it's a big centre in early Christianity. And so the efforts of one bishop to sort of make his city really, really important, and he goes out in the cemeteries and he finds that the bodies of the saints are there and builds churches over the bodies of the saints, the miracles, and a great uh, collection of money produced to build a, a, a huge cathedral. And then you know, somehow or other it survives when it, you, know, you feel maybe it could have been Venice or Ravenna or, one, or, or Pavia or one of these others, but, but somehow the sort of that initial success in building it up just at the moment when everything was changing so there's always an element of chance there, and of course there's chance the other way. Bad luck for Pompeii, a volcano explodes under it. Um, so you know, there's, some cities are, are, are struck by a terrible disaster which their builders could never have expected. At the end of the ancient world, which you could say something between four, six hundred years after the birth of Christ AD, uh, we begin to see a sort of general collapse of cities that some of the ones disappear almost completely, go back to being villages really, they don't, they're not wiped out, but you can't tell them apart anymore from the little, little farm settlements around. The really big ones, they collapse when they can't be sustained anymore because they, they were never self-sustaining. They, even their populations had to be topped up every generation. So the question isn't what kills a big city, it's how does it get unplugged from the systems that sustain it? So, you know, if we think about big cities today shrinking, like Detroit, and there's an obvious connection there with the collapse of the one big industry that ran Detroit. In the ancient world, it's more often a collapse of those political networks that bring all these resources together. De urbanization is quite rare in the sense, you know, most of the cities that were around in 500 BC were still there a thousand years later. Quite a lot of them are still there today. Rome, Athens, have never been 
de-urbanized. But what, what led to the big collapse of the big cities was when they got, they got unplugged from their life support systems. 